All right. Ooh, leave that for a second. Got it. Okay, I'm gonna find my AirPods. All right, give it a give it about two minutes. Great. We'll start shortly. Yep. Hello, all. Welcome. Feel free to use the chat box if you'd like. We're here. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Hello. And my name is uh, Lynn Nguyen. Welcome to our AAPI Communities and Conversation, a series of live online conversations between writers, creators, and librarians uh, and that centers Asian American and Pacific Islander voices, books, cultures, and experiences. This monthly program is hosted by the University of Southern Cal uh, Carolina's Augusta Baker Endowed Chair, Publishers Weekly, Weekly, and Penguin Random House Library Marketing. My name is Lynn Nguyen, and I'm the Young Adult Librarian at the Los Angeles Public Library's Chinatown branch. I'm excited to be here today, and it's my pleasure to introduce you all to our special guest, Ri Nyong Ok Lee, with a groundbreaking coming of age story about friendship, first love, and finding my voice from Soho Tea. This is a powerful novel from a powerful writer, and let me tell you why. Marie is an acclaimed Korean American writer and author of the novel, Somebody's Daughter. Her next novel, The Evening Hero on the Future of Medicine Immigration of Korea, is forthcoming with Simon & Schuster. She graduated from Yon University and was a writer in a residence there before she began teaching at Columbia University's writing division. Her stories and essays have been published in The Atlantic, The New York Times, Slate, Salon, Guernica, and The Guardian, among others. She was the first Fulbright Scholar to Korea in creative writing and has received many honors for her work, including an O. Henry Honorable Mention, the Best Book Award from the Friends of American Writers, and a Rhode Island State Council on the Arts Fiction Fellowship, and is the current New York Foundation of the Arts Fiction Fellow. She has been a Yaddo and McDonnell, McDowell uh, Colony Fellow and has served a judge for the National Book Award and the Penny O. Wilson Literally, Literally Science Writing Award. In addition, Lee is a founder of the Asian American Writers Workshop and was an Our Award Writer in Residence for the Columbia F FFA right, uh, program. Marie, thank you so much for joining us today. Our library and publishing colleagues are excited to hear from you. Wow, that was so much. Oh, Welcome, thanks for that Marie. introduction. That's amazing, Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> appreciate it. No. And appreciate yeah. all the people who've invited me and PW and Penguin Random House Library Marketing. Thank you all so much for having me. Well, we're so excited to have you here with us and thank you for just spending your day with us. Um, I'll start off by asking you this, if you could tell us a little bit about your book, what inspired you to write Finding My Voice? So I started this book actually when I was still in college um, and it's recently been reissued as you probably know. And um, so college for me was a long time ago. I I'm, mean, I'm, I'm 58 and a lot of times when I've always wanted to be a writer since I was nine years old. And a lot of times when you start writing, you kind of just write about the period that you just came out of. So in college, I had this idea I really wanted to write about something that I'd just done. And I actually thought it was going to be a book about people having fun in high school because I had all white people in it because I thought that was what was universal. Um, and so it wasn't until later when I was getting really serious as a writer where I realized there's something really fun about this. And I'd actually like tried out to write for Sweet Valley High and a bunch of things. But then I realized like this, the story is like very well crafted, but it, there's something that's not true about it. And once I got over the idea 
because there weren't other Asian American stories before. So when I grew up, the only other Asian American I ever, 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 ever saw in the library was Farewell to Manzanar, um, the, the memoir, Jean Watsuhiki Houston's memoir. But then also I was reading in like some acknowledgement that said like her husband actually wrote it. Like she kind of, it was kind of her oral history. He wrote it. So then I was kind of like, uh, I'm not interested in this at all. And I really got into S.C. E. Hinton's books, The Outsiders. So I think that was more like what resonated with me because there weren't other Asian American books around. And so um, once, and this was um, my, my boyfriend, now husband was also in publishing and he kept being like, why, why isn't there like a Korean American character in this? And, you know, we have so much better re representation, but you have to remember like when everything is like white, I was just kind of like, well, because we'd want to, we'd be interested in this. But then as soon as I made Ellen Korean American and just set her off on a journey, like all these things happened to her. And the book just com became completely different. And I was like really insecure about how, you know, if anyone's gonna be interested. And actually the first whole round of publishers, nobody wanted it. Partly because a book about like hearing about racism was somehow just too much for people. And then my, so my favorite rejection said, we had a book about Cambodia last year. And I looked it up, it was called like Children of the Elephant. It was like a white lady. So, you know, I'm already on this precipice of, I don't like publishing's not interested in it either. And I think one of the really interesting, so it is about a girl who is like me, a Korean American. She's growing up in a really small town in Minnesota where everything is white. But then her other sort of problem is like many teens, she just wants to have fun. And her parents are very, put a lot of pressure on her and she doesn't understand about how they were Korean War refugees and how schooling was so yeah. important to them and how they experience much racism. They want her to have the best like, background. All she sees is that she's being treated differently from her friends and she wants mm -hmm. to date. Her parents make it clear she can't date and then she's gonna have to major in some kind of science. And at the same time, it really, it is called Finding My Voice because a lot of it is her trying to, to maneuver between the expectations of her parents whom she loves um, and her friends and the, like, the larger culture and then figuring out who is she in between all this where she has spent much of her formative years having everyone else tell her what she is. And so this is kind of finally her breakout, so to speak, her, her opportunity to do that. And to, to me too, that's kind of what it felt like writing it. In some ways, it was like my do-over for high school. Like, if my, if you know, if these circumstances were different, like, what, what could it be like? And a lot of there's like a lot of like jokes because people think it's very autobiographical. Like, th my sister's name is Michelle. Her sister's name is Michelle, but Michelle is actually my sister's like the super nice sister, and I'm kind of more the overbearing. Mm -hmm. sister. There's just like a lot of little autobiographical jokes. Oh, yeah. uh, but I love everything you wrote about it because, like, I a lot of refugees. I wish. Oh, it looks like Lynn lost her connection. So I hope she'll come home so back soon, but I will show you, this is the newest incarnation of Finding My Voice. And it went out of print twice. And then the second time I had an Asian American editor. So after all that quasi scariness, the first time I actually had an editor who really understood the book and acquired it at HarperCollins for Harper Teen. And as these corporate things go, the book went out of print again for no fault of its own. It's always sold very well, especially as people have gotten more aware of the importance of diverse voices. But there are many books and corporate decisions are often made by people who don't uh, don't even work with books. Um, they come from other industries. So I was really, really lucky because BuzzFeed, um, I think in 2019, somebody wrote a piece about like books from the 80s and 90s that have stood the test of time. And I'm so grateful for this author for putting my book in there. And then so then it came out again which is really almost unheard of for books. So I'm very, very grateful. And yay, Lynn's back. Yay, sorry about that. No worries, <laughs> I told him it's your question sorry. though. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Um, I, was, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I love this book celebrates your culture as well. Um, and being that 
if they, you know, it talks a lot about the similar challenges that teens face. Were any of these uh, situations something that you grew up dealing with yourself? Or how did you pinpoint uh, what stories to pull from for, for an Asian American teen? How did you do your research? That's a really, really good question. Part of it was what were like the major things that moved me forward in my life. And one of them was, for instance, my English teacher. So also I changed her name by like one letter. It's at Klotzbach, it's Klotzbach, <laughs> because that's sort of an homage to her. Um, so I, I tried to kind of think of like, what were like really deeply emotional parts of my life? And actually while you were gone, I was like kind of blabbing on my own. And I was talking a little bit about how the book has gone in and out of print, not because it hasn't sold well, especially now with, um, the need for more diverse voices. It's bit, it, it's more like these corporate challenges. And my second editor was Asian American. But even though Harper Teen bought it, it just eventually went out of print. It came back into print. And one of the most interesting things I had now, because now there are more Korean American voices in YA, you know, like Jenny Han or like everyone's doing their own thing, David Yoon, it's really cool. Um, the, mo the interesting publishing thing that I encountered this time was a lot of the younger editors wanted me to change the book. We need to have cell phones and we need to do this and update it. And I kind of thought first, wait, if Ellen can call Tomper, then this whole plot doesn't work. But even more than that, I really tried to think about why I was feeling so resistant about it. Um, because only one older editor wanted to keep it the same. And I didn't want it to seem like, oh, I'm lazy. I don't want to redo it. That was not the problem. But in this, um, in this little bit, I think I'm going to read, I think there's like a little fragment of it. When Ellen doesn't, is scared to bring her Asian lunch to school, it's not kimchi, it's litchi nuts that she throws away in the garbage. And, you know, as an author, looking back, like, I was like, why not put litchi nuts? Like, doesn't, kimchi would have made way more sense. But now I'm realizing because my parents were, were refugees and pre-65 immigrants, there were no other Korean immigrants in general because of the laws. And they were indeed undocumented for a while. So because, it, um, Asians were not allowed to immigrate, there were also no Korean groceries, ergo no kimchi. And so I was realizing like, this is actually like a historical, like memento to some degree. Like this is a historical novel, unfortunately, not age wise, but it's just, it is, it is a moment in time. And so that's why I kind of feel like too, is, you know, we can't have too many Korean American voices or, you know, because everybody's voice is really different. And then, so I realized, no, I have this commitment to keep the book like this because Ellen's whole, you know, her whole experience is so different because also if she was a more contemporary person, even born in the eighties, there would have been a lot more Koreans around, even at least in culture. Um, as I was saying earlier, like the only other Asian person I saw in pop culture was the ancient Chinese secret laundry people in one of the worst racist commercials where these people mm -hmm. like Oh, I don't have where ancient Chinese secret yeah. where they're trying to like sell laundry detergent. And so like when you have role models like that, you either yeah. I think you just like absorb a lot of that, which I did. Like this is what Asians are like versus I'm Asian and I'm not like that. And I think to some degree, like the mix of sort of my low self-esteem, but also my outrage <laughs> over of portrayals of Asians was part of this like motivational stew mm -hmm. that finally got me to decide I'm going to write this book like no matter what and even though like the, like this one editor in fact who was this very big editor wanted me to change the voice out of first person and I just realized no the whole deal is I want you to feel like know what it feels like to be called a name yeah. and you can't do yeah. that unless it's not in first person so there were just like these little things I learned about myself along the way even though when I was writing it I wasn't always conscious what I was doing mm -hmm. absolutely well would you mind um doing a brief read for us from your book, Finding My Voice? I would love to, and it's very brief. What I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna read two little sections so you can see how there's like different tones in the book and they're all, these sections are actually really close together. Yes, it does start. Great. On the way to the bus stop, I slipped the container of litchi nuts into a garbage can alongside the road. Wasteful, I know, but I'm always so nervous on the first day of school all these kids, especially the popular ones. Everyone is at the bus stop, the same faces from last year and the year before and the year before that. But my throat still constricts. I wish my best friend Jessie lived nearby so she could take the bus with me. 
Two of the hockey players, Brad Whitlock and Mike Anderson, are loudly hooting and swaggering as if they own the place. I slip back and try to become invisible. When the bus comes, student bodies swarm up around the door like eager bees waiting to get into the hive. I let most of the kids go ahead of me, but as I board, someone shoves me from behind. Hey, chink, move over. In back of me is Brad Whitlock, a darkly adult look clouding his face. The sound of his words hangs for a moment in the cramped air of the school bus. Numbly, I look around. Everyone seems to be looking somewhere else. Out the window, at their books, just away. Brad pushes past me to the back of the bus where he resumes guffawing with his friends. So this next scene is actually on the next page. And so, as you can see, this school is kind of dominated by the jocks. It's Northern Minnesota where hockey is kind of like a religion. I, would, I shouldn't say kind of a religion, it is a religion. And so in this scene, Ellen is paired up with a different hockey player, not the racist hockey players that just pushed her, but the other hockey player who's always trying to cheat and cut corners and is not the brightest pencil in the box. So she's kind of bummed. Sorry, this is the wrong page. Uh, oh, the first word they're doing a vocabulary assignment is omniscient. This is Ellen. How about if we say God is considered to be omniscient? Yeah, sure, comes the muffled reply. Omniscient means all knowing, I tell him for his benefit. I do the next few words without seeing any signs of life from Mike. Here, you do the next one. I poke the pen into his hand and he clambers out of his stupor with gruff surprise. The word is sentimental. He scratches his head for a moment, looks at the word, then looks at me. He looks so uncertain, I feel sorry for him. Don't they ever use sentimental in Sports Illustrated? Oh, how about they took a sentimental journey to the center of the earth? He beams, how's that? He might be popular, I think, but he's sure not much to look at in the IQ department. Of course, when it is time to read the results out loud, we are called on for sentimental. It's your word, I say, giving him an edge. Uh, sentimental. They took a sentimental journey to the center of the earth. A pause, then the class hoots with laughter. Even Mrs. Klatz and chuckles. Mike looks around and grins as if he planned to be funny. That's what being popular is like. Everyone thinks you're great no matter what you do. That's not quite it, Mike, she says. Beth, you've tried. We became very sentimental when we heard our class song, she dutifully replies. Perfect, says Mrs. K. And this ends Ellen's first horrible day of school. Yeah. <laughs> oh, geez. I, there's, I, I love that um, you talk about, you know, the, 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 that section just because of, um, you know, you think about Ellen being Ellen and she's so smart and, uh, you know, everyone's just, you know, gleaming towards her because she is uh, very uh, studious in her studies and just, um, but of obviously the way that she's being treated by her peers and the other students and um, how nobody really stands up for her really what is what hit me. Um, so I wanted to ask you this then, um, you know, racism is, is very real. And I feel like now, even after COVID, it's even more prevalent um, and it's, uh, really hard for a lot of Asian Americans to um, talk about because it's happening everywhere. How do, uh, with the hate crimes, um, you know, rising against Asian Americans, like what is some advice that you have for people to, um, you know, stay true to themselves, like what Ellen is doing in her story? That's a really good question because it's been incredibly disappointing to me. Um, disappointing isn't even the right word uh, because, you know, for instance, I live in New York ever since I was nine growing up on the Iron Range. It was like, oh, I'm going to live in New York where everyone's really diverse. It's awesome. And to a large degree, it has been this way. However, during COVID and Trump, it has changed a lot in terms of 
um, anti-Asian violence, as you've probably seen, um, two young women got murdered, mm -hmm. um, pushed on the train, murdered. Um, a colleague of mine just got, got body slammed and she's, she's, a lot, she's older. Um, and David Henry Huang got stabbed in the neck. I, this is just very, my very small <laughs> community of people. Uh, we've experienced a lot of violence. And uh, another thing too, is that a lot of, actually librarians sometimes ask me, why is there always like a super weird, not super weird, it's not a weird. Why is there always an interesting pivot to violence in all your YA novels? And you know, one of the reasons that I can feel like I can make it more cogent now is I always say, well, the modern minority myth makes it seem like, oh, violence is like not getting a good grade on your, on your stats if you're Asian American. I said, and that's not the deal. The deal is that physical violence is very real against Asian Americans. And because of the model minority situation, which the stereotype is indeed a kind of racism that everyone just thinks, oh no, Asians are all rich and they're fine. And so that, that again, and I think in terms of like, what can you do? Part of it is really difficult because like, so you and me, the, the Asian American bookstore has been having these wonderful like days where they'll have, um, they'll be giving up pepper spray to people and it becomes this wonderful way for the community to come together. And I do feel like in general, like if I had a message, one of them is you are not responsible for racist things that happen to you because it's actually the other person. And, but I feel like as Asians, we often take it on ourselves. Like, what did I do wrong? Or I want to be like this other person. Um, there's that. And I would also say, so apparently Lynn got kicked off again, but I'll just um, finish the question. Um, in finding my voice in particular, people always say, oh man, I wish I had a friend like Jesse who would always stand up for me and so forth. And actually, as I mentioned, there's a lot of jokes in here, and I actually had originally used my best friend Patty's name in here, um, but because of some of the other details about her life, she did not want me to use her actual name. But Jessie is a real person. Um, she is my best friend, and she did, just like in the book, always stand up for me, including when I did not stand up for myself. Um, and one of the super wonderful things is when Finding My Voice came back out, I... I just randomly told my friends, my childhood friends, I just said, oh, by the way, this was during COVID. I'm having my launch. You know, you can come if you want. <laughs> I never tried forcing my friends to come to all my book stuff. But there was, it was like, it was, it was just one of the most amazing things for me when they turned on the Zoom and I could see all my friends from high school um, beaming at me. And so for, for you, for Asian Americans, I feel like having a support system is super helpful. And then if you're not Asian American, or if you are, if you're a human being, one of the things that I found is, has been so interesting is any bystander intervention has always helped amazingly. Um, whenever I was being super bullied and I would talk about like getting beat up, whenever there was one person who said, dude, that's not cool, the bully would almost always retreat. Just as like magic trick. And so one of the things that I would say that something that everybody can do is when you see something you don't ha and you don't have to be like um, the superhero with a cape. I saw a guy in the subway when so this Muslim woman was being harassed. He was eating a bag of potato chips. He just like started like moving until he was between him and the other woman, but he never stopped eating his potato chips. Like he just acted like he didn't know what was going on and that completely disrupted it. So I think these small acts are like jujitsu. It's like, this is like your superpower, the small amounts of disruption. And then when you see this happening to your friends, like stepping in for your friends, be a Jesse. Um, my friend Jesse was actually slightly more aggressive. She just said, I'm going to beat the um, bad words out of you if you do that one more time. That was super effective. Um, I'm not condoning it, but I'm saying that's what she did and it was super effective. So there's no one way to do it, but philosophically, just to do please remember, racism is not your fault. It is not your problem. It is the other person's problem. And also you do not have to answer if someone has to demand where you're from, why you look the way you do. That is not your problem either. That's a great message. I really appreciate you for sharing that and for sharing your personal stories of, of your friends. Um, you, know, what, you know, for API teens, uh, for kids nowadays, um, if they want to, um, you know, talk about how they can make a change, what are some advice that you have for them um, if, if they're facing this type of reality at home or at school? I think, you know, probably for me, 
when we started the Asian American Writers Workshop, uh, and we were just all our 20s, and we were all not, we didn't know what we wanted to do. We were all actually, I have to say, we were actually all ex-pre-med as well. So we were, we had all the family things and almost all, I would say 90% of the men in our group were trying to figure out how to come out. They couldn't figure out if coming out as a writer was going to be worse, and coming out as gay. And it was just this whole maelstrom of stuff. But I will say like, we're still, you know, these 30 years later, the AWW just had its 30th birthday. We're still best friends. So that's kind of, that's kind of the way that, change gets fomented, I think, as opposed to like in certain, so, so having certain social justice, like lists of things to do. Like having these friends has helped me to weather so many storms and knowing I'm not alone. And in this way, by being this fortified, I go on to write my next YA novel, which because I'm not alone, I can do. And I feel like, um, I was telling the group earlier when we were off camera, like I do go to like a lot of marches and protests, but at the same time, I think, I feel like the main way that I foment change is through my work. And then without a support system like that, you can't do your work of social justice, whatever it is. So to some degree it is, you know, make sure, you know, when the oxygen mask comes down, you secure yours first before going out to others. So by making sure you have a good support system and so forth, that will help you go out and do the work that you need to do to foment change. That's right. Find your support system. Find your support system. And it could be um, a teacher. So in your, yeah, or librarian. Or librarian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, you know, in your um, story here, let me see. My next question for you is, you know, you are the co-founder of the Asian American Writers Workshop in NYC, as you were just talking about it. Um, can you share a bit about your workshop and why you started it? What are some of your favorite, or who are some of your favorite AAPI writers that you've met through your workshop? Sure. So um, as a good immigrant kid, I want to be a writer, but obviously, this, and I'm finding this is almost an Asian American trope that's happening is how are you, how am I going to like live in New York city, make my parents happy, you know, be by myself and write. And so one of the things when I dropped out of pre-med is my parents said, Oh, you have to major in some kind of STEM ash ish major for which I realized at Brown, the econ major actually had the fewest requirements. So I went for that. And then I made, and then I got to take a bunch of other classes, but then I also did like an honors thesis that ended up being, I studied developed countries and women's labor force participation, and it ended up being super interesting and informs a lot of my work. And I had to work, the reality of being a writer is I worked at Goldman Sachs for six years on Wall Street. So until I could build like a slightly more sustainable way of living, yes, writers do not get paid very much. And that's, when, once I left there, but because I didn't, you know, get an MFA, that would have cost me money and time. So instead I worked, instead of getting an MFA, I was kind of wandering around all by myself going, I don't have any colleagues. And then um, this friend of mine just brought me to this workshop. There were only four of us in it. And we were all similarly, what are, we're all, we used to be pre-med, we want to write. We're not going to go get an MFA because we're working. What are we going to do? And, and then the, cra the crazy thing, the, the big impetus that happened is at one point, so Curtis Chin, who's, who was our first director, was like, oh, let's have a reading. Like he was always like taking it the next step. Let's do this. So we're like, okay, fine. And uh, we had it at what was then called the Chinatown History Museum. And back then we didn't have Facebook and digital stuff. There was only like this one, <laughs> like, you know how teeny this looks? There used to be this thing called the, um, the poetry calendar that they would give this teeny tiny like thing of all the literary events every week. You had to go to a bookstore to get it. We had our teeny little thing, like Asian American Writers Workshop reading and 200 people showed up. It almost got shut down because of the fire codes. And this is with like no advertising for which we realized that there is some real need that goes beyond us. There's a need in this for the community. And so, you know, the next need that we identified was similarly, we need to run workshops for people like us who are all working as lawyers or whatever. And um, one of our very first workshops was a bunch of lawyers, Min Jin Lee, um, Ed Lin, who still works for Barron's, um, Lisa Ko, Kathy Park Hong, we're all in a workshop together as newbie wannabe writers. And the person we got to teach it was this then unknown South Asian writer named Jubilee Harry. 
And this was this really cool community thing that we could do for like no money. And then ever since then, you know, you're asking me about my favorite writers, like for instance, then who comes in the door next? There's this woman named Monique Trong, who's like, I'm a lawyer. I think I'm a writer, right? I'm not sure. And then by then we were publishing this journal. And so she submitted to it, but her, her piece wasn't that good. So we had to reject it but she kept coming back and coming back. And, you know, now she's like this amazing writer. So we kind of, we kind of feel like this community space has become not only a place, we feel like it's a place just to amplify and add new voices versus Asian American writing has to be like this. And it's very much, and it's also, you don't have to become a professional writer, but this has been our one way, because as you probably know, publishing is still, it's 88% white, which is down from like 89% <laughs> like five years ago. And so there are real issues of like representation, gatekeeping. So it's I, in a weird way, metaphorically, it's like my friend group. It's like, where are we like gather our sustenance before the editors say, oh, we already had a bug about Cambodia last year. So you can come back and tell your friends or cry and then send it out again. Like this is just our way of just kind of lifting and supporting and amplifying. I, I think of it more of as nurturing versus we create writers because that's not what we do. We just nurture the voice that's inside you. And if it needs to get out more, we'll help you do that too. That's awesome. Um, if you look in the chat box, everyone, the website is there. If you'd like to join the writer's workshop, uh, anybody could join, right? Any inspiring writer? And again, you don't oh, have to great. want to be a, you know, you don't want to have to be a professional writer. Mm -hmm. And there's many ways you can volunteer too. If you don't, if you also feel like you're not a writer, but you want to help, there's just, and it's, a, it's just like a great community. I feel it's very safe. It just makes me really happy to be there. Great, wonderful. Do you have any advice for anyone that is inspiring to be a writer that may not live in New York or, um, you know, any advice for them? Yeah, that's, um, that's why we got really lucky because New York is obviously so dense that if I started like a kite flying club or something, there'd probably be people. Um, but one of the things that I did over the pandemic, this is what I find so ironic where I think, oh, actually, if you, if you need your community, you will because um, this friend of mine, I was interviewing for an article about how Korea is treating COVID and why we are being so dumb about our masks. And she just said, oh, you know, we should get together on Zoom. And then it escalated to, um, well, why don't we like write on Zoom while we're at it? And she's like, why don't we each bring a friend? So she's a Korean American writer. Her name is Chris Lee. So she brings this friend, she brings Leland Chook and I bring Curtis Chin, my friend from AWW. So of course we're all Asian Americans <laughs> in our writing workshop. But I even did a thing of poets and writers about it because from this like very weird spontaneous like group where we just met every week to do nothing. We actually like literally, we're all professional writers, but we literally do nothing but like do silly writing. We don't share it. We just write on camera. We come up with goofy prompts every week and we just like be with each other. Like this has been amazingly successful and we're still going on even though now we're in completely different, different time zones. We have someone in Korea, one in Cal two in California and me. Um, and then actually we added one more person. And so there's always ways, particularly I would like to, you know, see the pandemic has been horrible, but there's some ways that it has made things more open. I mean, even just something like this, where before we wouldn't really be able to do this because people aren't, weren't used to doing stuff digitally, but now we can do this digital event where a lot of people might come in where before, you know, I've used Zoom before, but it was only with a medical school. <laughs> so to see it like explode like this isn't really funny. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Zoom has really changed lives, especially during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, talk a little bit about the pandemic. What were you doing during the pandemic? Were you writing on anything or working on any projects? Uh, yes and no. So my novel that just came out, The Evening Hero, is that, ooh, I don't have a copy of it. I only have my other one. Um, that one I was working on and it has taken 18 years to write and publish. So I was working on, yes. Um, I don't know if I, when I started it, I would have kept, well, I probably would have, but so a lot of that had to do with, but then my son is high, has very many disabilities and then he was home and then we were trying to homeschool, which is really difficult to do during the pandemic. Um, so I was really lucky. I actually had friends who, I didn't even have to ask them. They just handed me key to their apartments when they like fled the city. So I had other apartments to run to. I worked on that and then, um, I have another young adult novel called Hurt You, which is based on, um, it's kind of a Korean American retelling of mice and men. So since my son was home so much, I also experimented, I reread 
of my semen, but I read it out loud to him. And I, so I tried to take advantage of the fact of, that we were stuck at home and trying to do things a little differently, even though it was, you know, and I still had to work at Columbia. And so, you know, people think, oh, there's tons of time. And I thought, you know, for some of us, I don't know if you have kids, but you probably figured out there's like a lot less time <laughs> when you have kids at home full time. So yeah, it's a busy pandemic. Yeah, wow. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about the evening here. Can you tell us what your book is about and also about your other book? Um, sure. Her? It's, this one's really different. It's about a man who is, he's 75 and he is a Korean War survivor. He was 10 when the Korean War occurred and he has a secret that he left behind. He was originally born in North Korea and then he moved to South Korea and then um, through the US military, he moved to the US and it's in a similar setting in Northern Minnesota. And he, but because of private equity and for-profit moves, his hospital has been closed, even though there's nothing wrong with the hospital. Now the community is left without a hospital and he's also left without a job. And because his son, who was the tiger parented son who went to Harvard Medical School, but now he's using his skills to work at what's called retailing, which is retail plus medicine. He's working at the Mall of America. He tries to get the dad to do this for-profit medicine thing that has to do with pubic hair depilation. And the dad can figure out nothing else that he wants to do. So he kind of does this for a while. And then at the same time, he's getting these letters from Korea that show that even though he came to America to kind of start over, somebody in Korea still remembers. And a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with his childhood. And we see, you all know what the secret is by the end. But a lot of it is questions about what is a meaningful life and is it ever too late to make amends when you're tempted to just do the easy thing and just not think about it. No, that's great. Um, I saw, um, oh, and you talked a little bit about Columbia University as well. Can you tell, can you tell us um, what you're doing over there with your writer series? Sure. At the same time? So I teach the advanced fiction workshop in the School of the Arts. Um, so that's what I do for teaching. And then I am in an interdisciplinary center called the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race, for which all of my colleagues, then we are, we all come from different departments like sociology, history, English. And I am um, core faculty in that center. And I am the writer in residence for which um, I, originated a series called the Asian American Diasporic Writer Series. And I'm also making sure by calling it diasporic, I'm also trying to open it up. We do a lot of things with East Asian studies and languages because the idea of the diaspora is, it's not just a, a binary. This is a lot about what my adult novel too. It's not, it's not a binary. Young Man didn't mm -hmm. just you know, immigrate and it's old country, new country. He had to migrate to South Korea. And then through history, he ends up here. Like, I think that the idea of immigration has become somewhat simplistic, like you leave and you come and you're American, but it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. So for this series, I have been just trying to do really, um, trying to also like push the idea of what is, what is a writer? Like I had um, a funny Asian series where we had like Karen Chi um, and let's see, oh, we had Sandra Singh Low, and I'm going to do one on, like cooking, because I don't know if you've seen a lot of cookbooks now, like has like story has become such a huge part of like the recipes, you know, and then we, we do, do, we had Michelle Zahner of um, Japanese breakfast with her memoir. Like it's just been amazing how many people will just come for, to do this for the students because it's, I hold it. And it as you can imagine, ethnic studies is slightly marginalized at Columbia compared to like brain, brain surgery. <laughs> so we have, you know, we have a pretty small space so that a lot of people will, when we did it live, give us their time and travel to New York to do this has always been amazing. And it's just been really wonderful for the students. Oh, and I will mention our very first series, um, we had Korean diaspora women. And one of the people on the panel was, was Kathy Park Hong. And then I thought she was gonna read her poetry. She's like, oh, I have this book that I'm working on. And it blew us all away and we're like, is there a title? And she said, yeah, I think it's gonna be called Minor Feelings. <laughs> yeah, so we've had like these amazing like in-person moments 
like that where yeah oh I love it I love I love that you're creating the space for for all Asian American writers and Asian American writers to, to come together in all you know aspects of your life because you have your writer's workshop and then you have Columbia you have it's everything so just working with so many different um, amazing people and inspiring them to to write and tell their stories Oh, I see some questions coming in. Yeah, no, it's amazing. So thank you for that. I'm trying to think. I just recently met an Asian American writer. Now I'm blanking out who it was because it, it's been a little bit of a whirlwind. But she was telling me how her parents were so encouraging of her being a writer. And I was just going like, oh my God, is this a generational thing? Or or did she just have really weird parents? <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah, no, you because you hear it all the time from like, you know, I that is really interesting because usually it's you, you, you know, Asian parents will tell you, you have to be a doctor, you have to be a lawyer, you have to be somebody that makes a lot of money. <laughs> right? Because then yeah, they can't no, sure. about us, and like writing has got to be, you know, and I admit it, it's got to be one of the most difficult, like precarious things you can do. But at the same time, I can't, I can't think of anything that's more worthwhile. And if anything, memories of having to work at the office, keep me from, keep me going to never, ever, ever do that again. Right? I mean, yeah, no, the 2008 sure. mortgage crisis coming from my office was just not wonderful. <laughs> you know I'm saying like, I didn't feel like I was contributing to anything except that I'm grateful that it allowed me the financial stability to create a sustainable career for which, as you see, I still have a day job though. Yeah. Being, well, 18, 18 years to write a book, no matter how big your advance is, and my advance was not big, it was like five figures. It's not economically feasible. Mm -hmm. doesn't make sense especially in New York especially in New York it's so hard <laughs> oh definitely <laughs> but you know but art doesn't make sense so you have to figure yeah. out the you know with the left brain what you're going to do to feed yourself for sure for sure um I have a, a few questions coming in from right. the audience um I'll go ahead and ask questions this one came in from Sarah Sarah here asks can you tell us about the audiobook uh was there an audio version when your book was first published or was it with uh, the more recent re-release, did you get any involvement with the audio version? Oh man, this sounds goofy. Is there an audio version? Yes, there is. I listened to your audio book and it's amazing. <laughs> oh, wow. Because what's weird is for my, um, my adult book, they had me audition the narrators and I know that book is like amazing. So, oh great. Well, thanks for telling me. No, um, this all of this happened and I don't, I didn't know there was an audiobook, but I'm glad to hear it's great. Yeah, it's great. It's really, really good. The The reader is really nice. And she uses a lot of, I feel like uh, while she's reading, she uses a lot of the um, Korean accents, um, which I really appreciate. Oh, that's great. That's exactly mm -hmm. for the adult book. Um, Raymond Lee is my narrator and he speaks Korean like slightly awkwardly, which is perfect because Youngman, the narrator has been away from Korea for like 40 years. Yeah. So it's just like, it's perfect. I love yeah. It. <laughs> we have a comment here from Joyce. Uh, she says, not a question, but a comment about it. It's noticeable in the news, Asian people are often physically bullied or attacked while Black people are sh often shot. I don't know if I've ever heard a Black author ask about the violence, if any, in their book. There's a comment from Joyce. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't get the last sentence of that comment. Um, she said here, I don't know that I've ever heard a Black author ask about the violence, any, in their books. Oh, sorry. Ask who about the violence? I'm sorry. I'm not sure I totally get your question. I don't want, so I don't want to give you a wrong answer. Uh, Joyce, if you're still here, uh, feel free to comment or to type in the chat box. Oh, I see. Now when I'm reading it, um, I don't know if I've ever oh, heard Joyce is here. Hey, hey Joyce. Hi. Hi. So it wasn't actually a question. It was a comment. You were talking about um, how someone had asked you about the violence, like the turn of violence in your books. And I was thinking, one, that often um Asian people are often like physically bullied like they're pushed down or you know beaten up whereas black people are often just like shot and I've never heard not that this hasn't happened any black author ever being asked about hey you know your 
story took a, a turn for the worse. Right. Like there was this crazy, you know, violence. So I was thinking about that. And so I get, a question is like, why would someone ask you that versus like any other author if there's like right. violence in their book? I really do think it has to do with expectations. You know, so sort of like there's like, a, there's like this criminalized like tropes, like, but then with Asians, it's like, oh, Asians like are so smart. Of course, what, the, they're rich, the, you know, this, this whole model minority thing. Like, of course, violence doesn't occur to Asians, just sort of like, so, um, yeah, I had something about, um, so, so it, again, I, I didn't do this purposely, but I myself um, experienced a lot of physical violence when I was growing up like just getting beat up all the time, like quite severely, badly enough that I wanted to take karate lessons when I was nine. And then ironically, my parents were like, no, 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 that's too Asian. You can't do that. And so um, I have a black belt in Taekwondo now because it, this is something that for my bodily autonomy that, um, uh, you know, I'm 20, like 30 when I'm learning Taekwondo, but it's something that I always knew that I was going to do. Um, and interestingly, my next novel, Hurt You, is about an Asian American person getting shot. And and that one was also a lot of, we can't buy this book from you because you can't have your character being shot. <laughs> you can't have them die. So it might be similarly like some kind of weird stereotype, like Asian people never get shot. Of course they do. Just like Asian people are incarcerated, like Asian people do everything. Um, so I think similarly, there's these ideas, I, that's what I'm hoping, like, I don't feel like I do this like intentionally, but to some degree, I feel like I know what my reality is and society keeps saying like, oh, Asian people don't get shot. Asian people don't like aren't in violence. So let's not have it. Like, let's not have a representation of this in the book. And then also from a personal standpoint, um, the book, this, the incident that happened um, was re that is based on is real. Um, a man with intellectual dis disability was shopping at a Costco um, in LA, I believe. And there was an LAPD officer who was off duty and he jostled the person and the guy kind of started shooting everywhere. And then the parents stepped in to try to explain what was happening and they got shot as well. But it became this, oh, he's a monster. And he was like, as opposed to the cop was like randomly shooting people. And this also has to go back to, so my son is non-neurotypical. So I also saw this very clearly. Um, you can look at any statistics where people are afraid of people who have mental illness or mental disabilities but their chances of getting shot, particularly by the police, are much, much higher than they are for um, just your neurotypical civilians. So that was also something that, again, why didn't I didn't want to set out to like, I'm going to like upend the model minority stereotype by doing this. But it, I think it was because this experience resonated with me so much that, again, this just became a way for me to represent um, this particular experience. So what I've done is I've tried to take this case in Costco and move it to Of Mice and Men. And then the bunkhouse becomes not like where all the cowherds are, but the Korean American like cram school where a lot of the inner dynamic stuff goes on. And so to that degree too, I'm hoping that what Viet Tan Nguyen talks about with narrative plenitude is just about having like more stories. And so I guess in my own way too, I feel like, okay, now it's time to attack the classics. Let's decenter them from like this white vision that everybody has to read in high school, just the, the way I only read white people in high school. And then I started feeling, I think I'm white because this is all that, like, this is my whole like culture that I've ever known. So I want to do a book that is all Korean American, like all the main characters are Korean American. And there's one African American boy whose mom makes him go to the cram school. Um, so let me do like an entire person of color book and that for this general audience, let's all read about a book where there's very few white people. Just the way I had to read books that were all white people when I was growing up. So that's exactly. kind of, yeah, it's kind of my thing. Well, cool. thank you. I'm looking that's forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great question. And thank you for explaining yeah. that um, in depth. Um, I have one last question here from Miriam. Comfort food during the pandemic. Oh, wow. What were you eating? What were you delivering? Oh, <laughs> we were too scared to get delivery, but then I was, you know, my brother got me an air fryer for my birthday. And if you're a vegetarian, they make this thing called pumfu, which is tofu that's made out of pumpkin seeds. 
I think I just made a lot of tofu. And Korean food was totally my comfort food. I think I know how to make kimchi and I have to go and buy it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think in general. It's delicious. Yeah. It was kind of fun being in and cooking. I, that's such a good question. I, kind of, <laughs> I am actually missing that a little bit. I really am. Because I'm trying not to do things like eat over the sink, like go back to yeah. those old habits. Mm-hmm. Because we do have time to be mindful about it. Yeah. So that's such a good, thank you. <laughs> I'll try not to like hurt <laughs> eat before my next meeting. Great question. Well, Marie, uh, you know, if any of our audience members want to stay up to date with you, what is the best way they can follow you on social media? Or, or do you have a website that they can follow and follow, uh, listen to your blogs? or? Anything? Oh, thank you. Um, so my website's very easy. It's marie.lee, M-A-R-I-E dot Lee dot net. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's Marie Lee. Sorry, it's Marie Lee, one word, dot net. Um, and I'm on all the socials at Marie Myung Oak Lee. And I'm also recently on TikTok. Um, yeah, I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> it's, my TikTok name is daily, daily underscore writing underscore makes underscore book. I know, right? What can I say? TikTok. I'm finding TikTok, it like really no. funny. I'm, I'm loving being on TikTok. I'm trying to do book talk stuff, but I just end up like wanging off into doing weird things like sending things to music. What do you do? <laughs> I love that. We'll definitely have to give you a follow. And thanks Miriam for plugging in all of her social media accounts there in the comment section. So uh, Marie, thank you so much for oh. t- spending time with us today. Thank you to our host, Dr. Nicole Cook the, from the University of Southern Carolina, Augusta Biker Endowed Chair, publishes weekly, weekly and Penguin Random House Library Marketing. And a very special thank you to all of you, our amazing audience for joining us today. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. We hope that you'll join us for our next AAPI Communities and Conversation event on August 2nd with our guest author, James Yang, and librarian Karen Wang of the New York Public Library. So thank you all. Excellent. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for the, your great questions, Lynn. Thank you, Marie. I, thank you all. Stick around for a minute. If anybody helps us, any more questions? Thank you all for joining us.